Hello, welcome back to the Cubase Fundamentals course. Today we're talking about a bit of a scattershot subject, which is trying to protect our PC um, from the CPU hammering it takes when running a door. Now Cubase has lots of different means by which we can help to reduce the CPU burden, and we're gonna have a look at a few of those today. Um, as always, I'll upload a copy of this project file to my Patreon account. If you wanna check out the Patreon link below, um, help support my channel, that would be great. Uh, okay, let's get on with it. First thing that we're going to do today is actually make a user interface um, change. In preparation for this video, I, I decided to try um, a new interface um, object on my main screen, and that's the ability to freeze tracks. Now, what this does is basically takes any processing that's being performed on the track. This could be insert eff effects, as we've seen today, or it could be the VST instruments themselves. For instance, Groove Agent, you know, is very challenging a computer to produce all of that audio in real time. By freezing a track, we basically make a raw audio copy of whatever it sounds like in our ears. So here we have our guitar chord track. And if we have a look in the inspector, this little um, snowflake symbol is the, is the freeze audio channel option. So let's click it. We get the option to set a tail size. Now this is for stuff like reverb or delay. If you have things that bounce on after a sound has finished, then creating a tail allows the delay or reverb an opportunity to naturally expire. Now it defaults to five seconds. I very rarely change it. If you've got a really massive delay, then you might need to make it longer, but five seconds is absolutely fine. And we just say, okay. So what Cubase has just done is converted that entire track into a completely flat, fixed piece of audio. It's not doing any processing on it anymore. If we have a look in the mix console, all of the inserts have been grayed out. We cannot interact with this track in any meaningful way while it's frozen. We can still do stuff like turn the volume up and down, but we can't add sends. We can't add any kind of insert effects at all. We can't even see the audio. It's really quite hidden from us. But the beauty of it is that it has no CPU burden at all. It's literally just like playing a WAV file. Now, while it's frozen, the little orange symbol is gonna remain lit to tell us that this track can't be interacted with um, at all. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add that frozen symbol to my um, permanent display. If I go into track control settings for audio, I'm gonna add the freeze button. And I'm also gonna do the same for VST instruments. Let's click apply and here it is. And you can see in Groove Agent, this rhythm track here is the Groove Agent track. I'm gonna to have to make my curtain a little bit wider and then that button will appear. And that's going to be, for the time being, my new permanent um, setup. I'll actually change my template to this effect as well. So I'm just going to audition that button, see how I feel with it. I think the ability to freeze and unfreeze directly from the interface is sufficiently useful for me to want to see that button all the time. You get this nice little visual cue on the event itself as well, a little lock symbol to tell us that uh, we can't do anything with the track. If we change our mind and we want to do editing on this track, no problem at all. Just click the button and then we get these options. Now, I always just basically click unfreeze because in the intervening period, I'm likely to do some kind of processing with it. And so I'm going to need to generate new uh, freeze files when, uh, when I come to refreeze this, if I choose to. It takes all of that process in a way and we're back to a regular track. Actually, while I think on, I just remembered that we've got a load of rubbish in our audio pool at the moment. I've not been very well behaved keeping this nice and tidy. So I'm just gonna move all of that to trash and then empty the trash. So we've got a nice clean pool to play with. Some of the stuff that we're, do we're gonna to do today is gonna to interact with the pool. So it's nice to get that all sorted beforehand. Let's have a quick fly around some of the interface options we've got. One of them we've already seen. It's in studio setup, audio system, and ensure that you have activate multiprocessing set. I have said this before, but I'll just repeat it. It's the most important option you can possibly set. Do that. The next one is in preferences, uh, record audio. And we've got this option to create audio images during record. You know, when you press record and you can see the image being built on the interface as you go, 
well that takes a little bit of um, CPU to take care of so it's one of those things that you can if you're just prepared to accept the hit you take on the graphical interface um, pleasantness then you can disable that function I, I never do I, I, I like to see the audio appearing as I record and another one that you really want to uh, be aware of is VST plugins suspend VST3 plugin processing when no audio signals are received one of the most important features that was introduced in the VST3 protocol which is over 10 years old now was the ability to um, to identify when no audio is passing through a VST and therefore disable the VST, basically shuts it down. Now this relies on manufacturers actually complying with the VST3 protocol. Of all of the stuff that I own, there are two companies who haven't yet implemented VST3 versions of their packages, and their sound toys and native instruments. And it makes me really sad. If you ever go on the forums uh, and do a search for either of those companies and VST3, you'll just see rafts and rafts of people saying, please, <laughs> please, can we have VST3? VST3? All of the other companies do. If you head into your plugin manager, you can see the, th the VST version of all of the software for both effects and instruments. And when choosing instruments and effects, uh, the VST3 protocol is the little three hashes. So you can see all the Steinberg stuff does and the sound toys stuff doesn't. So each of these packages, you can see which of the, uh, the instruments are or aren't VST3. Makes a big difference on your CPU burden. We have a quick look at freezing VST instruments. You get uh, a couple of other options. This radio button allows us to decide whether or not we basically shut the entire strip down. I typically only freeze the instruments, but this is great. Unload instrument when frozen. If you've got that ticked, then you're basically completely freeing the entire instrument. So there is no better solution than freezing, and that should be your go-to solution. But as far as audio is concerned, we've got more options. Now, one of them we've already seen briefly, which is bounce. So we wanna have a bit more of a look at bounce today and see what it's really doing. Now, we used it earlier to trim the beginning and end off an event and say, this is what I want. I don't want any of the other stuff, my other 15 takes that were all complete rubbish. This is the event that I wanna keep. And that helps us to keep um, a clean and tidy pool. But you can also use it to make permanent um, CPU intensive operations. So if we have this event here, I'm just going to save my projects in case I make a right mess of this. And we go into the editor. Now I can do any amount of processing I want on this thing. I can do audio warp changes. They require CPU. I can increase or decrease the volume of the thing by clicking and dragging this little box in my event. Just make this a bit bigger. I can put fades on the beginning and end of the event. And all of this stuff takes CPU power to process. None of this happens by magic. The computer's having to work all of this out in real time. So once whatever editing that I've done um, to the event, if I'm happy, if I'm happy with it all, then when I select bounce and it asks me if I want to replace the events, then all of that is now baked in and doesn't require any um, CPU processing. If we have a look in the pool, you can see, um, as we saw in the previous example in an earlier video, it's created a new um, audio file for me. If I decide that I've changed my mind and I don't want any of that stuff, we can abandon all of those changes. When I clicked save earlier, I can revert to a previous version of my project and now when I click revert not only is it going to throw that stuff away but it's going to identify that I've recorded some new audio that third WAV file that's just appeared well I don't need it anymore so I can say delete it now we're back to the audio as it was when we have a look in our pool we're down to two events there's nothing in the trash that event has just been completely removed because Cubase has identified that it's completely unnecessary, I've effectively undone it. So Bounce is really good for making changes to the actual audio itself. One of the other changes that you can make as far as real-time processing is concerned 
If we just go back down into the bottom window and re-engage audio warp. In the process option of the inspector, we've got this option to flatten. If I click flatten, it's going to give me an option for the algorithm preset. Uh, and you can see all the various options available. Real time is, I, I don't think I've ever changed any of these presets, um, but I, I'm sure they're very good. But um, I just basically choose real time, say OK. And now that uh, audio warp version has uh, once again, it's been baked into the event. Have a look in the pool. And here is our um, third event. Everything that we do, if we say flatten, Cubase needs an actual audio file to represent that change that we've made. It's not magic. It's either processed in real time, which takes work on the part of the computer, or it's an audio file, which can just be regurgitated. And that's really simple for Cubase to do. Once again, throw that change away by reverting. And that cleans all of that stuff up for us. And again, confirm delete. And then the flattened version of the file is gone. And we're back to two pool files again. Now, very shortly, we're going to come on to look at Vary Audio, which is another type of audio processing that has a flatten option as well. So processing is everything to do with real-time processing on that event. The last option I'm going to show you today is a variation on bounce, but it is actually a, a genuinely different thing. It's called rendering. And with render, we, we take the audio as it is with all of our real-time processing, potentially all of our insert effects as well. We've got various options available and we're going to generate a brand new track in Cubase with a brand new version of the audio completely distinct from the original. So this is like Bounce Plus. We're going to edit, uh, we want render in place and we're going to opt we're going to go into the render settings and see what's, what's available to us. Once you've chosen these settings, then you have the option to simply select render with current settings. And I actually have um, a shortcut button um, set up for that. Okay, from the top, mode as one event or separate or, event or block event. If, you're, if you've got a track with five different audio files, for instance, let's cut this thing up. So we just made two events out of, the, uh, out of this uh, guitar chord um, part. If I uh, select both of those, and go back into my render settings. If I say as one event, when it renders it, it's going to turn those two events into one. Let's do it. We're going to go through all of these various options, but I just want to show you it and then we can come back and have a bit more of a look at what's going on. I'm just going to click render. Okay, so it's now created a brand new track called Guitar Chord One with a rendered um, symbol on it. And and see that it's muted the old track. It's stuck both of those events together and we now have one composite um, event. And notice something else that's really important as well. It's a stereo event. That's because when we created this guitar chord one track, we created it as a stereo track. And remember that I said there's basically no reason to ever not use stereo. If you do a lot of rendering, that's a reason because you're going to render a stereo file and you might not want a stereo file. Let's undo Control Z. What I'm going to do is create a new audio track. Uh, but this time I'm going to create a mono track and I'm just going to call it mono guitar. I'm going to set grid relative so that I can drag these events down and have them in exactly the same place and I'm going to put them onto my mono track. And now I'm going to render with exactly the same settings. And I'm just going to click render with current settings rather than go back into the settings box. So you can see I've got a shortcut for it. So let's press that. So it's rendered the entire track. I didn't have any events selected, so it's done the entire track. And here you can see my event and now it's mono. Let's undo that again. Send it back up to the stereo version of the track and do yet another render. So this is basically just repeating what we did the first time. And what I'm going to do now is a little bit fruity. 
I'm going to turn this stereo track back into mono for reasons which will become apparent very soon. Project, convert tracks, multi-channel to mono. Don't worry about these options. We're down a bit of a rabbit hole here. Just say OK. And so now we've got two tracks that to all intents and purposes are identical. So you might think, well, each one of those is just the same as the original track. Not quite. If I bring these, so this is just one half of that stereo track that I just created. I'm going to make both of these tracks nice and big. And you'll see that our original event is louder than our single event down here, our rendered event. This is something called the panning law, which basically says that if something is panned to the left or right, it gets quieter. And there are various different means. If you Google panning law, it's an enormous subject and there's a very healthy debate about what panning laws should be set. But you can actually find it in your project setup. And here you can see that Cubase sets its stereo pan law to minus 3 dB. Which basically means if you pan something hard left or right, it gets 3 dB quieter. And that's what's happened here. When these tracks have been rendered, they're both 3 dB quieter than the original. And so when I just select one of those tracks and have a look at it, it's 3 dB quieter than the original. So just bear in mind that if you go through that round the houses thing, you're not going to end up with something that's absolutely identical to your source file. It's going to be quieter. So we're back as we were with our original track. And now let's have a quick look at these processing options. Even though there are four radio buttons, I only ever pick the top two. I either do a render uh, completely dry, which means that any insert effects that are on that track are going to get carried across to the new one. I'm only rendering the audio. That's my most common option. The second option, channel settings, will bake in the insert effects. So if you've got something like a compressor or an EQ on your track and you um, select process the channel settings, it'll, it'll process that compressor and EQ as it's doing the job you can see the progress bars carrying through and once the tracks finished rendering you will no longer have insert effects on your output rendered track let's do that now we do have insert effects on our track we've got a compressor and a chorus so let's see what happens when we do that here is our rendered version yes granted it's stereo but that's not what we're most interested in what we're interested in is the fact that we no longer have any insert effects if we listen very carefully to this you will hear the chorus. There's the chorus. It's been baked into the audio file. Now that's a little bit extreme for me. I generally don't tend to do that. If I've got tons of processing and I know I'm completely happy with it, it's a way to basically reduce the, the processing overhead because you can throw the insert effects away. But just bear in mind that these are all one-way one journeys. Now at the moment, in our pool, we've got all sorts of stuff. So it's keeping a track, Cubase is keeping a track of all of these files that we're creating. If we decide that this is going to be our permanent one and we delete the old one, then you know once we clean the pool up, that stuff is gone. But as of right now, nothing is permanent. Nothing's happened to the original source material. If I click revert, delete the old files, and here we are right back to where we started. Last thing to mention today, a lot of this stuff in terms of file names is pretty self-explanatory. You know, figure out for yourself where the audio gets stored and the file naming convention, it's all straightforward enough. This uh, source track settings, either mute or disable, perfectly reasonable. Obviously, if you mute, it's just temporary. You literally just click the mute button. Whereas if you click disable and then render, then you can see it's actually shut that track down. If you want to re-enable a disabled track, then right click on it, click enable, and then it comes back to life. That'll do us for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, hit the like button. I'll see you for the next time. Thanks a lot.